it's great that you've stayed around for what I think should be a fantastic final session. It's called It's Not You, It's Me. So it's the George Costanza <laughs> uh, version <laughs> of, of ODR. And we have um, several uh, fantastic uh, speakers or answerers, I suppose, <laughs> in the mode that we've um, uh, adopted throughout most of the interactive mode we've adopted, I think quite successfully, throughout this conference. Um, which is us not talking to you, but all of us talking amongst uh, to each other. Um, the pa other panelists are uh, Katie Miller, who's at the end, who's known for a long time in different capacities, but is now at the um, long-winded anti-corruption commission of Victoria. Long overdue, but and long titled. Um, Madeline Oldfield, who's spoken at this conference previously, who's an independent management consultant and, and the former director of Resolving Disputes Digitally for VCAT, and Michael Heron, who's a former Solicitor General of New Zealand uh, and founder of CODR, C-O-D-R uh, Limited, who's spoken in the first session this morning and a number of times throughout the conference. Um, sitting with me, someone you pro I'm not sure what you do, <laughs> <laughs> except for everything. Yeah. But uh, Kathy Laster, who of course is the executive director of the Suzelman Cowan Center at Victoria University, and with her fantastic staff, uh, the um, organizer of this conference, which follows on, many of you remember from the one uh, two years ago. The most striking thing for me is what's happened in those just intervening two years. Um, everything has been more sophisticated, become more sophisticated, more questioning, uh, more intelligent use of the technology, more powerful technology, more focus on ethical and uh, equitable issues, equity and access issues. So this one we're looking at what still can be improved, so when we have this conference again, perhaps in another two years, it'll be interesting to see what other issues um, we, will have to, we will have already solved and what other ones emerge. Um, so I've talked about the speakers. This is again going to be, as several of them have been throughout the conference, um, an interactive one. So we'd encourage you to go on Slido. Yes, Slido. Keep wanting to call it Sluggo, but it would work as well in some cases. But Slido.com. And please uh, hashtag your questions with ODR Melbourne, and they will come up in some way on the screen. And uh, you can also support someone else's question. So the ones that have the most uh, ticks rise to the top and I'll probably uh, choose those to put to the panel. I will certainly do that. Um, and then, um, then we'll be off and away. Um, do you want to do lingo bingo now? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we're going to give a prize to whoever managed to get the most on lingo bingo. Lingo bingo, the maximum anyone could have was 16 crosses. Do I have anyone between 10? You get a prize. Anyone 10? Anyone 5? Anyone fill it in? Oh, <laughs> up the back. <laughs> okay, then, uh, you got 5? Oh, six. Six. 6. And seven. more than 6? Six. 6? Six. Seven. 7. Right, anyone else? 9! Nine. 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 Yeah, you're the winner. <laughs> okay, so you get the chocolate. So 9 gets a chocolate, <laughs> uh, 7 gets a chocolate, and uh, uh, the other 2 can get a chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the purpose of that, as is everything, is that it's, uh, it's an educational tool. You can so do it with your staff as well. There's a, a lexicon which was created by Code for Australia. So it's actually a way of getting people to look up the meaning of those terms and start using them more confidently. So keep your forms. But thank you for playing Lingo Bingo. It was very good of Code for Australia to do it for us. Big clap. Good luck. Well done. There are also evaluation sheets, but wait till the end of this session because it'll be great. Um, and people, and they're in paper form. 
The reason they're in paper form is I can tell you, in this is another important ODR point, people don't fill it out online. Mm -hmm. We've done it, which is really weird. Evaluation yeah, sheets in, in paper form only. Is there any other that kind no, of there will stuff? Be later. We'll go right to the questions. Sure. Okay. So we're still waiting for your Slido questions to come in. And while they're coming in, do you want to put the cartoons up? Sure. Yeah. Me? No. <laughs> no. Can I just ask, is there a code for going online? I'm finding I can't get any coverage um, on the Yes. The, where the, uh, um, the connection, internet connection is... It's rendezvous, um, the Melbourne conference one, and the code is Melbourne all lowercase. Hmm. Seems to be a particular problem with Optus phones. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, nice. High quality password that you'd never be able to get. Melbourne, all lowercase. Okay, a few people were cheeky enough to um, send their questions to my email. <laughs> so, I don't know whether I should feel bad about that you've got questions or, there too, yeah i know <laughs> uh, but uh, so i'm gonna i'm gonna say that those are i'm not going to be a lawyer and say those are ultra vires or anything <laughs> like that i'm going to take them so we had one interesting one came through that said what are the lingering effect are there any lingering effects of the old taboos on legal dispute resolution things like prohibitions against advertising um, and and all of those professional bars about the, what solicitors and barristers do differently, and so I put that to the panel. We got Fiona mm. in the audience. Yeah. Fiona's best to answer that one. Uh, no, different Fiona. Fiona McClay. Is there any lingering, are there lingering ill effects mm. of the old taboos? For example, the prohibitions against advertising in the promotion and effective use of ODR. You want to take it on notice? Yeah, I've not even thought about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a view. Yeah. Um, so I do wonder whether we do still have some of these cultural discomforts with um, you know, ways of practising that we don't see as being aligned with either being a lawyer or being a public sector employee. Um, I have talked to people who, you know, are um, interested in innovating and when the discussion comes around to well how will you actually tell people what you are doing how will you actually get out there and you know create a market essentially um, people recoil I've seen people physically recoil, recoil at that, that idea um, I think also as lawyers for a very long time um, we haven't been really good at articulating what is it that we actually do I think in part because we don't really think about it that much we just do it it's a practice you know it's like saying to someone how do you ride a bike how do you drive a car well I don't know I just do it um, and I think as a result, um, we're used to sort of projecting our own personal brand and talking about the cases that we have done. That's how we brand ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, as, as we get more into innovation and some of this legal stuff starts to be products, um, we're talking about things in a very sort of sales kind of way. And um, I have had some really interesting experiences where people have sort of said, well, no, we can't really talk about that at this sort of event, you know, at a conference or something like that, because that sounds like you're selling something. Um, and for me, I'm sort of sitting there going, well, how else do we tell people what else is available? Because the public's idea of how you resolve disputes um, is still very much you know, informed by Ali McBeal and Law and Order. Um, and I've just totally <laughs> date, dated myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, that's my view. Fiona? Um, so I thought of something that people to say now. Um, <laughs>
can do both things together, actually. We can be a public service profession that has higher ideals around the rule of law and, uh, and, and obligations to the court, but also uh, be practical problem solvers who can articulate the value that we have. They're not, they're not the false binary. Mm. Yeah, can I... Um, I, I, I do think there's another taboo or another strange cultural thing in law, I'm not sure about Australia, but we regard that the higher up the case, you know, the more senior the court, we all think of that as more important. If you look at barristers' websites or the like, the cases that they've done, the higher the court, the more important it's seen as. And regrettably, I think the l lower cases in tribunals or maybe even online stuff, it's kind of, you know, slightly looked down upon. And like when I talk to people about Kodo, look, this is a smart way of doing things online cheaply, quickly, they're kind of like, yeah, okay. Um, mm. So it's a slight negative perception, I think. Did you know? I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I have to just put that out there, right? So my, my take is quite different. So thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is where I get nervous. Um, and I guess my take is a little bit different because I have a comparative group um, where I look, I work in, across lots of different industries, financial services, telco, utilities, and, and digital and tech. Um, and I actually think sometimes lawyers are their harshest critics. I actually think that of all of the industries that I work within, I actually think that lawyers are primed to accept change. And the reason, and prime for this new kind of digital revolution. The reason I say that is because their entire profession is built on not knowing the answer. Mm. Where if you take precedent, if you take the law, if you take the statutes and the different frameworks that you work within, you're not really sure. You can sort of navigate a path, you have a kind of North Star that you're aiming towards, but you don't have a definitive answer, and that doesn't often happen until you maybe get in front of a. Um, you know, a, a higher court, and then, then you know, more uncertainty is created in different areas of the law. And I think that if, you know, it, the topic is change management and embracing change management, and I think one of the things I would love to see change is that sort of internal um, recognition as, as lawyers and as a profession, that you've actually got the skills already, and you have been doing this for a very long time. And of all of the industries that I see, I think people who work in the legal profession um, are some of the most uncomfortable in uncertainty. And I'm getting some strange looks from the audience. Uh -huh. But if you no, think about, yeah. I guess, why I say that, it's because um, you have to act when you don't have all of the answers and you have to advise on that. And I guess taking those sorts of um, you know, frameworks and taking some of those that mindset and behaviours into the world of, of ODR and digital revolution, I think will be quite a, uh, something I would like to see from the legal profession. Mm -hmm. This but, is an idea. But there are some things I think that are more difficult for lawyers for a lot of reasons. Some of, you know, the obvious ones, legal ideology is, you know, conservative. We don't want sudden change. We don't see that as a good. Um, that's why, you know, we have separation of powers and it's the politicians who can do whatever they like, but the law is stable and static. Some of it is the way we think and precedent and looking backwards rather than forwards, all of those things. But there are certain features of the digital revolution which I think lawyers have been caught out and, I, you know, quite acutely. So if you think of what's been the impact of the digital revolution, I think there have been the collapse of time um, and lawyers have always taken a lot of time and we think it's too long if the thing is loading for more than half a second. Mm. So collapse of time, collapse of distance. Uh, so the whole global thing, the, the internet, everything about it um, is no longer jurisdiction specific and lawyers are always jurisdiction specific, you know, really tied to the locale and we don't have a locale um, in the new world. Um, the other thing which is, you know, a little bit um, controversial is the collapse of hierarchy. Mm. Um, and that means the collapse of expertise, the rise of DIY in every possible way, um, and we don't have we don't have the same veneration for expertise for professionals as the Zuskin point. But hierarchy generally, I mean, age, um, you know, the law firms are devastated because you know the the junior lawyers don't have the same deference, and the judges are at top of a, of a hierarchy. And the the difference in the technological revolution 
is as profound as the collapse of the feudal hierarchy. Mm. So we've always thought about the world as a hierarchy with a bit of movement in between. I'm nearly finished. But now the world is about circles and inclusion and exclusion. So people want to be in, inside. They don't, want to leave, they don't want to be missed out. So it's about a circle rather than a hierarchy and I think that's hard for law. Yeah, that's a really good point. We are so hierarchical, or at least that's the world I've grown up in. Yeah. And uh, it's quite difficult to accept. Mm. And unsurprisingly, rule oriented. Mm. Yeah. So I know in, uh, at, the, uh, at the New South Wales and then Australian Law Reform Commission, I was the principal commissioner at one or the other for nearly 20 years, so hired literally generations of new, young, bright lawyers. And they were very bright and very highly motivated. And I always had to give them a lecture after a short while because you'd say, well, we want to go this direction. I'd say, no, you can't do that. The High Court has said this. And I said, yes, that's why we're the Law Reform Commission. <laughs> if we were the Law Stasis Commission, you would be absolutely right. And it was interesting. But these are bright kids. These are kids who won road scholarships and you know, uh, double medal winners and so on and were gravitated to law reform and yet they felt constrained by what they saw as settled law, even wow. in areas where this, you know, the law was, the nature of it was laughable and clearly inappropriate for many reasons. So there is something instinctive in that legal education that you've got to, and I think others have talked about it during this conference, that you, you've got to break out of. The other point I'll make, and just this leads into the first uh, of the um, questions, is we, we seem to, and maybe it's human nature rather than lawyers, but we look for the legal equivalent of penicillin. So in the 60s, it was community legal, legal aid, community legal centers, legal aid. In the 70s and 80s, it was law reform. Then it was specialized tribunals. So each of these things, then it was pro bono. So each of these things is suddenly going to make a major change in access to justice and efficiency, efficacy, uh, equality. And, you know, all of them helped. And uh, so those are all my passions for many years and still. But um, they didn't quite get us all the way there. So the first question is, <clears throat> it's 30 years since the ADR revolution, which promised uh, access to justice, lower costs, reduced delays, and it seems to have failed. I'll, that's the question. I won't make that judgment myself necessarily. What can the ODR revolution learn from that experience? Mm -hmm. Kate, Kate? Uh, well, my first, um, I'm going to do the classic lawyer thing. I don't agree with the premise of the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I don't think that the ADR revolution failed. Mm -hmm. I think that on many measures it was successful. ADR is no longer alternative. It is now all about appropriate dispute resolution and it's in some ways very mainstream. I mean we have the Victorian Dispute Resolution Centre in Victoria which is a state funded service um, you know, based on mediation and conciliation. I mean I think 40 years ago that would have been absolutely unthinkable. So I think that in a lot of ways we, we it, it's been successful. I think perhaps what it hasn't been as successful in doing or, or perhaps you know society has sort of started to take it over is that we still have people who are missing out we still have people who can't access these services either because they don't have the skills or they don't they don't know that they exist um, so and I don't think that's because ADR failed I think it's because our society kept developing and kept becoming more complex and we just sort of haven't kept up um, I see ODR as being the next stage of ADR and I think that a lot of the things that we were hoping would happen in the 80s um, become more tangible and realistic with ODR because it is able to scale and it takes away a lot of those barriers of time and distance and, and things that yeah. Cathy mentioned. Yeah. yeah, because in the arbitration world, as you know, you, you know, lawyers have kind of recreated litigation and arbitration uh, whilst we all say, oh, it's faster and you get to choose your forum, etc. But it's like running a case, mm -hmm. you know. It's the same process and maybe a bit faster. But so... I think, yeah, as uh, Caddy was saying, the asynchronous, the location, I mean, arbitration, mediation, traditionally, you still have to go somewhere, mm. not now. Mm. I guess, from my perspective, I think one of the things that may be a little bit different this time around is if we can take sort of proxy learnings in other industries and apply them. So, 
Um, for example, I think one of the differences is we've run a lot of IT projects out in industry and we have some good grounding on what works and maybe what works doesn't work so well. And when we perhaps, again, I wasn't around to, to talk through the law reform, obviously, but, um, you know, were we solving the right problem back then? And I guess with some of the new techniques in human-centred design and strategic design, we don't necessarily have to have the answers to these questions, but what we do need to do is experiment and get the metrics and the data towards the right answers. So these new techniques will help ensure that before we commit to something in a really big way, we've actually got the learnings to guide us to see within you know, some rails whether or not we're, we're on the right track. Mm. So again, that old kind of big bang approach to running projects where you bring the change on in three or four years time, hopefully if you've got a really big amount of investment, I, my personal view is those days really, if, if they still exist, they won't exist for much longer. The concept of a project probably won't exist in the future. I don't even think it exists now, personally. Um, and the other thing I would say is because projects don't exist, this stuff never ends. So if this stuff never ends, as lawyers, if you want to be at the curve now, it's learning the skills and techniques that will help ensure that you're at that curve because it doesn't end. So some of the terms you might hear, I'm sure they're on lingo bingo, so you might get some prizes by the end of it, is continuous improvement, Lean Six Sigma helps to kind of um, put you in the right mindset to have that, they call it growth mindset, it's another one of those words, but the idea that you always have to have this in, you know, continuous <coughs> and eternal curiosity. So that's one of the skills that might help in the future. Again, not to say that anything that happened before wasn't right, it's just being more refined and we're, we're evolving towards a, a different space now. My theory. Okay. And I'm a project manager, so for me to say that, yeah. it's okay lawyers, project, project, project people have had to go through the same evolution of thinking and I'm sure I've got some colleagues in the audience who'll smile and nod when I say that. Okay, um, th thank you. Next question is about um, ODR and power imbalances. Um, I'm not sure ex the premise of the question is exactly the way I would have phrased it, but it's not my question. Um, <laughs> It, but th the suggestion is um, that these were more visible to decision makers in, in existing fora. But anyway, just to put it more neutrally, um, how is ODR dealing with our increasing awareness of the uh, detrimental effect of power imbalances and dispute resolution? You can always look to me for, uh, for an Tell opinion. Me. Madeline keeps looking at me. She knows I've got an opinion. Um, I think that if we're not conscious about this, uh, then we will either entrench existing power imbalances or we will unwittingly create new ones. Um, and I think if we just look at what's happened over the last 10 years with Silicon Valley, that's, that's pretty much what happened. Every new whiz-bang gadget, we go, oh, this is fantastic. And let's face it, the people in this room, middle class, educated, you know, have a bit of power. We go off and all of a sudden we've got cheaper power bills and we've got cheaper transport and we're gaining the benefits. Um, and it's usually, you know, five, six years later that we see the people who have had to pay the price. So um, I think that with any new technology that is giving us the ability to change the world. I think we need to be really conscious about <coughs> who is going to benefit from this. Um, and I've heard, I, I hear a lot with ODR that, you know, efficiency is an objective and absolutely in government, efficiency has to be an objective. But I think in government, we also have to be really um, conscious about what sort of society are we designing here. Mm. Um, those people who were in the last session on um, accessibility and vulnerability, uh, and Annabelle had to leave, but she comes from Suncorp, and the insurers have been working on this far better than the public sector. So they've been very conscious of all of the figures that are not well known. So people in the session can remind me, um, what's the percentage of Australians who earn less than $55,000 a year? How many, what percentage of Australians earn less than $55,000 a year? Isn't it like 40 or 50%? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Does that include um, interests and riders? Like I don't think so. No, that's, that's the median wage. So the median, the median wage, wage. Um, is around, um, I thought it was 60000 but yeah, $55,000, $60,000. $60,000. That's the average, which is distorted by Gina Reinhart. <laughs> <laughs> So, and we were looking at a number of other really important figures, and I think the point is we actually don't know. I mean, 
when you talk to a group of people and the insurers do know because they're the ones that have to make decisions about whether someone is insurable. Um, I mean, help me out the people who've got those figures from the session. I haven't got them in front of me. Nikki, what, ask the question. <laughs> ask the questions that we couldn't answer easily and that are surprising. Percentage of women who don't work in the, well, limited work in the workforce. Underemployed. Underemployed. Both part, you know, very part-time, casual, or not at all. 40%. Forty percent. So all the masculinists are saying, oh, women taking over the <coughs> world, and we don't need any more feminist stuff. Yeah. So these are these are issues around us not knowing and not knowing it as a society. I mean, when Bob Hawke made that famous speech, you know, no Australian child will live in poverty by the year 2000, that was actually a good thing. I mean, he's been really pilloried about that. But at least we had a kind of ambition and he, the figures were then known. So it, it's about educating ourselves about these vulnerability figures and, um, and sharing those stories. I mean, mental illness, you know, now we know astronomical figures of family violence. Um, so it is about the context and how people are aware of that context, or made aware of that context. I might just, to uh, anecdote uh, really, but not uh, statistical, but one of the areas that we deal with is relationship property and um, the court system at the moment in New Zealand, the family court, if you want to go to a hearing, it takes you two years mm -hmm. from the time you file. And the, the major problem with that, and it uh, arises from those sort of figures, of course, it's often the female that's without income, without assets, and so a faster and fair resolution compared to the same old chugging along, burning up legal fees. I mean, it's massive, uh, the difference to people. And again, this is, this is a really great example of, of proxy information that we, we need to bring into this sector because, I don't know, I get a little bit nervous when an insurance company knows more than my government about what's the right policy decision, you know? <laughs> and therefore, if our policy decision isn't um, well informed, then we can't, how do we write, run the right projects? And if we don't run the right projects, how are we going to get them the data to write the next policy? So it's a cycle that keeps feeding itself. So part of what I think needs to happen, certainly any time that would come through with ODR as the example, the policy settings are right. We've tested it at BCAT, everyone knows, right? We've, we've got a positive hypothesis around the access to justice. But now it's about getting that next little bit of data that's gonna better inform the next step and so on and so forth. So that mm -hmm. it doesn't become a guessing game. It doesn't become a, oh, it's not an issue. And I get that's hard because, and, and this is something that, that's certainly the private sector's facing, that they don't enjoy making these things visible. Because if you make these things visible and you know about them, then you need to do something about them. And doing things about them takes effort and energy, and that isn't something that everyone wants to do. But I actually feel that sometimes it takes more effort not to do something than to actually do it, right? You know, the, the old story of being nagged to do something, it's just sometimes easier just to do it. And I think in this sort of example, imagine being able to have the information to actually genuinely know whether or not you're on the right track. It's empowering, and I think it will actually, um, actually make more people excited about the change. So one of the things I think that's really critical in any profession, certainly the legal profession, is that, I, I, and I know this is something that we did at VCAT, we certainly didn't go to the members with just some good ideas. Mm. We didn't, we couldn't, I knew I couldn't face Justice Quigley with, ah, oh, I've got this really great vibe about ODR. Mm. It just wasn't gonna fly. As a Supreme Court judge, as well as a president of VCAT, that wasn't gonna go down too well. So create evidence. Right? Win your argument for whatever you want to do in your own organisations based on sound data. And if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know the answer, therefore what I'm going to do is run a control, a pilot, with a fixed amount of money for a fixed amount of risk in a fixed amount of time and see whether or not I can get a gauge on that. And again, using data to inform that is how I believe the corporate sector is winning the big problem spaces. We don't know where to start and we don't know what to do. They just kind of pick a spot and start better than not starting so mm. I think that's yeah something something that I'm sorry I missed the last session because it sounds quite fascinating and interesting but um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I do think there is an element of just do it uh, and with lawyers it's a really difficult balance I remember starting as Solicitor General and that's a it's a different role in here it's the chief executive of a, of a law firm basically Crown Law Office is 200 people 
and we were in an old building across four floors and when I arrived uh, we, we, we knew we had to refit the, um, the office and the argument was who's going to get offices and who's not and um, the rest of government was open plan pretty wow. much all and I went and saw the chief executive of uh, the biggest ministry and I walked out of the lift and there he was in open plan and I went ah I've got the answer. <laughs> Who, <laughs> who's going to get the offices? No one. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, we dropped a third of the size and then went digital was the trade-off. Yeah. Uh, iPads and iPhones, etc. Some people totally hated it. Yeah. And, uh, but we, I don't know whether it was right or not, but I, we just said, let's just do it. Good and uh, I think long term it's worked. Mm. Ask the current solicitor chief. <laughs> Okay. How do we find the right people with the right skills and capabilities to ensure that change and innovation is implemented effectively? Okay. Oh, I was just going to say um, greenfields and brownfields. So greenfields, you can do very careful selection. Uh, you can do what Shannon was able to do. Um, they go through a very rigorous process of selecting the members, in fact, giving them trial um, judgments to write and you know it's kind of behavioral interviewing and everything else um, we have a brownfields system so it's a question of certainly selection and over time but then some pe some of the good new people come in and the systems and the culture is very different and they can't do anything about that so um, it, it's about education as much as selection and we're constantly dealing with that in law. Um, and the power is in the brownfields group, right? So um, the, those two things have to go together. I will say we didn't realise at the time what a genius we had in Lynn Slade who set up the Victorian um, College of Judicial Administration. And the, one of the things that Lynn did was put the main resource kit for judges, which is really the bench books, which saved their lives, really, as law became more complicated, only online. And there was a huge uproar among the members of the bench because they were not digitally literate at all. They printed out their emails. But you created, you forced them by necessity to build those skills. And Lynn did that because they all realised they were not, you know, no matter what fighting and garrying on was going to go on, that was the only way. It was too changed too quickly for it to be updated physically, um, and that was how the judges learnt how to use online resources. So it's not about beating them over the head, but it's exactly the same rewards, behavioural things, incentives, and so on, to create, you know, a vision, a culture. Um, a learning environment which is supportive, um, you know, it's it's reverse mentoring, which my staff do with me mm. all the time. <coughs> you know, no, Cathy, you press this button. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's all of that um, as much as selection. But of course, you know, when we say the right people, the right people in one year mm. and not necessarily the right people in five years. Definitely. It's actually gone full circle in terms of technology. When I was learning to be a lawyer, I was a dictator, right? I used a dictaphone and then I had to learn to type. Now we're going back to talking and I love it. <laughs> you know? I'm going to talk to those machines and so on. So it, 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 I don't think it's as easy as who are the right people for this moment. I'll just pull you up on one point. The judges did not print out their emails. Their, <laughs> their associates out their emails <laughs> printed right. it out because they couldn't yeah. figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, this is actually a topic that's quite close to my heart as well. So um, I've seen a couple of different ways that um, it works and it doesn't work uh, when you bring together the public sector and the private sector in building you know, new things together. Um, so a couple of tips if anyone's thinking about going out there. So I absolutely believe that you've got more than enough skills in the VPS. I'm just not sure you've got all the skills right now at the level that it needs to be. So um, where possible, my first um, approach certainly, and I've used this on a number of projects, right? So not just at VCAT, but when I was at Department of Justice, is that VPS first. If they've got this, I don't even need the technical skills because technical skills I could teach. I just needed the right culture and mindset. So start with that, start with the right mindset, start with the right culture of people wanting to give things a go, this growth mindset, 
being comfortable in ambiguity is something you need to teach and just make people, uh, or sorry, um, recruit people who are interested in learning something new, who are courageous, and are honest and are collaborative. So start with those skills. Don't worry if they've got Word or PowerPoint or can you know, write requirements, that is secondary. So absolutely fundamental to start there. Where that's not available, then you might want to supplement from um, you know, consulting or contractor panels. So a couple of tips with this that I've always found really useful. I build it into the contracts of anyone external to the VPS that it is their job to upskill the VPS. So any, any vendor contract must include an element of continuous impo improvement, coaching, mentoring. Um, and that is not just an informal thing, that's a day-to-day, -day, on the ground, partnered, shadowed, whatever it is. So apply the 70-20 learning um, model if, that, if that's useful. Um, and the other thing that's absolutely critical, and I was very, whoever, whoever wrote this line in the Access to Justice survey, thank you very much, because I took it to heart, and they said, um, part of what you know we needed to do at VCAT was to share the learnings with others. And if that's not built in fundamentally with what you're doing day to day, how are you gonna train the next generation? So the fact that we've just managed to share stories today about what we did and tips and techniques, maybe that wouldn't have happened if there wasn't such a strong emphasis on learning and sharing um, and upskilling. So I think the, the the, um, you know, there's a lot of talk of old oh, contractors versus VPS. It's it's not an, an it, it's it's a blended solution. There are certainly whoever mentioned I think it was Fiona the, the binary conversation. Nothing mm. anymore is binary. It's and it's and propositions. It's VPS and it's contract staff and it's vendors. The 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 hard thing is of course getting them to work together when you've got very different cultures and different levels of skill. But that's where some commercial understanding is good. Some of the structures that you put in place for the teams are also necessary to enable that to happen. Um, but fundamentally, number one thing I would say is find the right people that just want to give it a go. Mm -hmm. So I think, what's his name, Richard, who's he, a virgin? Who's the CEO of Virgin? Branson. Yes, Branson. Branson. He says, we hire for temperament and train for skill. Yeah. Yeah. Temperament. And you're talking yeah, about too, huh? certain it's qualities important. of temperament. Which might mean we're going to get, after a while, the same problem that later on we'll need people with detail. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and this actually feeds in nicely to sort of my take on this. Um, I think the right person um, really depends on well, what are you trying to achieve in this project or in this moment or in this phase of, of your organisation's existence. Um, and I think that that requires us to be really clear about um, the expectations that we are setting, that we are managing, to be really clear um, about the challenges that we foresee. So for some organisations, you are going to want a really good technical person because you don't have those skills already. Um, for other organisations, it may be that it's the people change management that you really need. And so you need um, you know, somebody who's going to be a good diplomat and somebody who can you know, persuade people. Um, and in that situation, the smartest person in the room may be the complete wrong person to bring into your organisation. Um, I would also say that I think that a skill set that we increasingly need um, is an ability to actually understand, I guess, the conceptual or theoretical underpinnings of what we're trying to do. Um, and this in some ways goes back to this question about power imbalance in, in ODR. Um, if we are recreating the world anew, um, then we kind of need to go back to first principles of what are we actually trying to, to do here. Um, we had some conversation earlier today about you know, the place of courts, um, if we've got all of this you know, ODR and ADR and all of these options. Um, that actually requires us to go back to that fundamental thing of what is it that courts can do that nobody um, else can do. Um, and I might just do a gratuitous um, shout out here to Joe McIntyre who is currently working on a paper um, about that. Um, and just as an example of you know, how awesome technology is, you know, the reason that we sort of got onto this sort of topic was having a chat on Twitter today mm -hmm. um, about this. So um, I'd just like to throw in those little pearls of That's let's not forget how far technology has been able to bring us already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things, um, Katerina Palmgren's paper she talks about, and I, I really uh, subscribe to this thinking, is you have to get leadership of the judiciary on board with this. Uh, new Zealand's about to have a new Chief Justice after 20 years of, of the, the same uh, Chief Justice. We've just got a new secretary, where that's the head of the ministry. Um, and if the new Chief Justice or the new Secretary or both don't want to change, then it just won't go anywhere. Uh, I mean, 
On Saturday, Saturday Spin Review, we had the Chief Justice of the High Court and the Chief Justice of New South Wales giving a talk to the barristers, to mm. the, it was the ABA, the Australian barristers, saying technology is here, get over it, you've got to adapt. <laughs> so, you know, that was the first time that it had been in a sort of concentrated, very high level. Mm. Um, so you do need you know, championing and leadership at the top. And what I liked about the VCAT thing and Madeline's insight into it was they chose to work on the pilot at the pointy end of adjudication for a lot of reasons. One was the one that you heard today from Liz um, because they couldn't fix it all there and then hit the, the wall with, um, you know, everything slowing down at the, at the serious end. But really it was to be able to bring... Um, people who needed ownership of it with you on that journey and they identified their bit as the most important and nothing you did anywhere around it was going to have any moment unless um, they were comfortable with the process. So it's also about a change management process and deliberate strategies of change management which I think the VCAP people did really admirably. So, so if I can turn that into very practical terms because that's why I'm here to explain the practicalities. Mm. Everyone, anyone in this room ever had a steering committee for their projects? Oh, a couple of... Oh, that's good, that's good. Um, so we, uh, there, there was a presidential directive uh, uh, when uh, Justice Guard was, was in the seat of President Vika, and it's something they do every year. They assign members, unwitt you know, unwilling members perhaps, but some willing, uh, to certain uh, steering committees. So I had a, a presidential elective, uh, directive where we had the names of those uh, four wonderful members who unfortunately got allocated to my project. Um, unfortunately, they also got allocated to my project, which basically meant that the old ways of thinking about a steering committee... Now, I don't mean old ways that we didn't document. In fact, if anyone would like to see where all the documentation is and you're on trim, the CD references are right next to every artefact, so it's very structured. And what we did, however, was that we built what's known as a cross-functional team. So this is something very common in Agile. It's an Agile principle around collaboration, um, where the entire team is a blended team of cross-skills. My one learning, if, if I could, sorry, sidebar, and the one skill that I thought was missing that I would probably bring back in if I had the opportunity, so a learning for me, was to get a seconde from Department of Justice in the policy area, just because I think it would have provided more insights. That was my one learning that pretty much everywhere else we, we had covered. Members, internal operations staff, expert um, external people coming in, vendors, but also VPS staff who were part of the continuous improvement and learning model. Um, the members were part of that all the time. So we didn't just meet in a steering committee once every couple of six to eight weeks. We had them sitting in the co-location space, which we call the ODR Experience Centre, and had them actively participating in decision making. I facilitated a procurement process, as many of you may or may not know. Big tender, went to market, completely complied with all government procurement, but I didn't make the decision on which solution to select. That went back to the panel of the members and the VPS staff. And so that's how we came up with a recommendation to the board and the decision maker. So I just want to sort of, I guess, explain that there's ways to do the change within the frameworks that are set from us within government. And it is actually possible so that, um, but it does require asking more of what you would normally expect from people on, on these committees. But these are the sorts of small changes or small tweaks within your existing structure that you can make to get that buy-in and engagement. And a good example that if you don't have that, I would strongly recommend not continuing with your project until you've got that. So it's a basic principle, isn't it? You can't just take, you know, the willing and the enthusiastic. You actually, to get change, you've got to do it at different levels of an organisation, um, different perspectives, yep. um, and make that work. And then you've got whole of organisation ownership. So we, we sort of saw ourselves as a pilot team as facilitators of a process, as opposed to decision makers or, or drivers. Um, it, was, it was very much a collaborative effort. So we were very clear about our North Star and our goal, but the sorts of tips and techniques that you can use along the way, this is one. Um, the other thing that was critical and I think really important to shifting some of the, um, the thinking of our, um, our team, and I say team in the broad sense team, um, was the fact that we actually had real user and customer and, and um, citizen insight. So that's also critical to the success of, of, of what we managed to do from a change management perspective, because we could go back to actual verbatims or data or something that represented the voice of, of the community um, outside of, of the institution. And I think that was critical to the success. Cool. Anything else? 
There's, um, so that's all really interesting from an institutional um, perspective. Um, there are a bunch of questions that are premised, slightly differently worded, but premised around the idea that lawyers are extremely resistant to change. So what are some effective strategies or tips for trying to bring lawyers around in the ODR area? <coughs> well, the first thing that I would say um, is that um, I actually think that Madeline's right. I think that we are probably, we've probably been changing a lot more than we realise and we probably don't celebrate the successes um, enough. Um, you know, we are in... You know, we've got people practicing who, you know, in living memory didn't have computers and, and you know, they've sort of adapted to that. And not just adapted, but really taken it on. I mean, look at what's happening with e-discovery. Um, that is a reflection of lawyers, you know, seeing the opportunities uh, presented by technology. So I think we, we are better at change than we give ourselves credit for. Um, to the extent that people are resistant, um, I think the argument is a very simple one. Um, if lawyers really are a profession and we are here um, to act in the best interests of our clients, uh, then it is, um, an, it is a professional imperative that we change. Um, because I don't think that anyone can put their hand on their heart and say that the system we have at the moment is in the best interests of our client. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that continuous improvement is something that we are professionally obligated or obliged um, to do. Um, I think that it's also, though, that we, we do need to understand, I guess, the, the cultural sort of framework that lawyers exist in. Um, and I think that if there is a risk aversion, um, there are some drivers that we need to confront. Um, the first is that, you know, lawyers, are, at the end of the day, um, our ability to practice is an individual one. So we, um, you know, if we make a mistake and it affects a real client, um, there may be real consequences of that for us. Um, and so, and it, it, we're not like tech companies. We can't just sort of declare bankruptcy and then open up, you know, with a fresh new name and brand and everything tomorrow. Um, and and look, that's probably good because it means we don't have cavalier attitudes. And I don't think that lawyers want to be cavalier. Like, we want to do things in a way that's going to work for our clients. We don't want to experiment on our clients. Um, but that does, I think, mean that we find it challenging to then say, well, where is the safe space? Um, to experiment and to try something new. Um, so I think a couple of things that could help with that um, cautiousness um, is that I think that there is a role for government, possibly the regulator, um, to make some positive statements about what is allowed. Because I think that if it's just left up as, well, you know, the legislation allows it, you know, you put two lawyers in a room, you're going to have three opinions on what yes. the, law, the law allows. Um, and I think that unless lawyers are given the green light and actually said, you are, it is OK to do this, um, there will probably be a bit of aversion to doing it. Um, I think the other thing that's happening with a lot of regulators in, in other industries is this idea of the sandbox and I think that it would be great to have um, a legal sandbox where you can actually have lawyers come along and sort of try out some of the things that they're Absolutely. thinking about and actually sort of stress test them to see how they go in, in, with, with legal ethics. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Fiona. 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 Fiona.
think I think one of the things I'd lo- I love, uh, I really, I get excited hearing about sand pit ideas. So that's awesome. <laughs> nice, nice new exciting thing. Um, I think the reason, and whether it's a sand pit idea or a hub or whatever you want to call it, um, one of the one of the things I would um, put to 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 our learned friends in the room is um, the fact that lawyers don't exist in isolation. Right? It's not a system, I know. I appreciate that perhaps historically it's been a system that's orientated around maybe the legal profession or the judicial mm. profession, but it's part of a greater ecosystem. And in order for things to change, obviously the ecosystem has to bind together for it to change. So I think one of the big things that's critical is all of the voices balancing the conversation. So if you find yourself in a room where it's just lawyers, that's a good moment to pause, look around, try and bring some others in and just test that thinking a little bit. So. Um, and I, I, honestly, I, would, I wouldn't just say that about lawyers, I'd say that about anyone. And then one of the things that we came across um, was, I guess there's two things, and, and it's part of the viability lens if you know human-centred design. So desirability means, sorry to hash this out, but desirability, um, what do humans want and need? What do people want? Viability is what's it going to cost us for what risk? Risk is important here. And feasibility, what can the tech do? So the viability lens, If every time you have these conversations, one of my... Um, asks of you as an audience is to go out and ask yourselves those qu- three questions every time. You know, what's desirable, what's viable, what's feasible, and it might generate new ideas and new conversations. Not just what can ODR the tech do, but what can ODR do in the context of all of these other factors. So, um, you know, to, to Fiona's point, if she, she does decide um, to kind of create these spaces, it's really important that everyone gets involved. And maybe what the community want is for the legal profession to remain exactly as it is, and that's okay, that's some guidance. But you don't stop there just because you hear it once. You find regular ways to bring in this feedback and you find regular ways to adapt and innovate and we call that continuous improvement. That is continuous improvement. It's the recognition that things don't end and as soon as you've got to an end point, start doing something else to make it better because you never end. So if the mindset can shift from, oh my God, thank God we got there, we put in ODR, we put in some new widget, you're not done. And if you get there, that's actually what I would call failure. I, I think um, mm. one of the problems, and Richard Zuskin raises this absolutely, is the idea of a lawyer and the metaphor of a mm. lawyer and public conceptions of a lawyer and then ones that lawyers then internalise. Um, and they really are paid pessimists. <laughs> you go to a lawyer yeah. because they're the ones that are going to protect you from risk and anticipate all the problems. And that's how we train our law students, right? They are the uber risk people, right? They're the ones that are anticipating in every contract all the possibilities. Um, And I think um, that creates a particular mindset and Richard and his son in the latest book go through new terms for sort of unbundling the skill set that lawyers have and say, why can't you call them you know, creatives or I forget the terminology he uses, empaths and so on. Um, Because, you know, we may have got to the point where, you know, conjuring up a lawyer in our own mind and in the public's mind is completely different from actually the skill set that we're using for a variety of different things that we do and things that we add value because of how we're trained. Mm. Um, So, you know, I know law firms started calling themselves... um, you know, whatever it is, law firm, and business consultants for a while, you know, multidisciplinary practices. But there may be actually, there's a lot in a metaphor. For example, one point, um, I've been trying to convince people that the court system has shifted from being a wholesale environment to a retail environment. And initially everyone goes, you can't do judges and lawyers say, oh, you can't say that. But the second you absorb that metaphor, whole lot of different things become possible in the way in which you see the job you're doing. So there's an awful lot in the language and the way in which we use metaphor to understand our role and that of the public. And that mental model, and I totally agree with Cathy on this one, and and again, just you, there's a, a thousand one industries where you can take the proxy and just watch it watch it unfold. And the terminology we use is again we were talking about hierarchies before as, as part of a as a as a structure as a picture you might hold in your mind. Today it looks more like I think I think the, the terminology is holiocracies, right? So they went from hierarchies up and down to matrix structures where you've got 
two masters at the same time, if anyone's ever worked in Project Land. Um, and, then, and then these holiocracies, which was almost like networked environments. So you have these teams or tribes that get together with specialised mm -hmm. areas. And so they say the way of the future, and that's much more aligned to kind of the way it sort of works in a natural ecosystem, right? Like the, the plankton's as important as the whale is as important as the, you know, the, 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 the seaweed. So I guess, again, if we're talking metaphors about how these structures may be looking to work in the future, I think one of the skill sets for lawyers that really needs to kind of be um, informed time and time again is that one growth mindset around curiosity, um, being comfortable in ambiguity, and there's a whole bunch of literature around that in change management as well. Um, Dr. Jason Fox is kind of like, he has a fun way of talking about ambiguity. If anyone's interested in uh, some quirky ways and business speak, but at least entertaining business speak. Um, and so I guess thinking about things differently, as Cathy said, I think will be key to navigating the future. Because if you're applying the mental model that is in um, you know, a hierarchy structure, but you're actually operating within more of a networked kind of structure, where you're relying on your different networks yeah. to get the outcome, it's gonna be broken. And the thing that's scary about it is with technology, it leads to distributed justice. It's not centralised in institutions anymore. And banks are seeing this already and will continue to see it. Other industries have already seen it where they've been disrupted. So until that um, recognition happens in the law kind of community, if it doesn't happen here, it's going to happen anyway. And, and I guess um, I've had a few sort of fun examples in the project team over time. I mean, you know, Uber, Uber to the taxi industry is kind of the, the obvious one. And, um, uh, but the one that I love that Beatrice always talks about is Gmail and, and Google to Australia Post, you know, and that was sort of 10 years ago, wasn't that, you know, and, and, and how fundamental has things changed from that? And OzPost was almost on, on the brink. And you'd think the taxi industry with Uber might be similar and hotels with Airbnb. So again, food for thought, use the proxies and see what's happening in industry and start to see whether or not you can pick up a skill that's totally unrelated to the law, maybe do some CPU points, maybe that's one thing that could, uh, be changed and amended in terms of learning and professional development that you can take learnings from other disciplines um, as part of that legal uh, learning and understanding. Maybe that's one idea. Uh, mm. since, um, since Fiona has asked, I am going to um, just put in my bids and these are my <laughs> bids, they're not IBAX bids. Um, excellent, so my bids. Um, I think that we need to um, provide some more clarity and really confront the cost issue. Um, I don't think that lawyers making money is a bad thing. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, if we are going to overthrow capitalist society, I'll be there on the ramparts, but until that happens, we need lawyers to make money to be sustainable and to still be available to provide the legal services that you know people people need. So I think we do need to, um, I guess, I would love to see some guidance from uh, the regulator about um, costing, uh, because I think that a lot of our understanding of what costs are permissible is still based ultimately on traditional ideas and mindsets of what legal services are and, you know, the bill of law and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you have a service where you say, well, I'm going to tap into ODR and I'm going to, you know, open up a little kiosk where people can come and I will guide them through it and I'm going to charge them a flat fee of $50. Is that permissible? I don't know. But we come back to people sit, look at, you know, yeah. read the legislation and go, well, I think it's okay, but I'm really not sure. I think we need to provide some positive guidance about costing in, in different types of, of legal services, so that's one. Um, the second is I think we need to clarify whether we are regulating the service or the person, yeah. and this comes back to, you know, is because I hold a PC, is everything I do therefore regulated? Um, and does that make sense in a world where somebody with some really good tech skills could actually be providing exactly the same outcome yeah. uh, for the, the end user? Um, and the third thing that, that I would love to see um, is I think we really need to seriously revisit um, the requirement to be supervised for two years after you gain your first practising certificate um, because at the moment we, we still have this hierarchical funnel that means we've got lots of graduates coming out and we're not getting the market benefits of having lots of smart graduates come out, try different things and meet this huge access to justice gap that we have. Yeah. So when I hear people say we have too many lawyers, I'm like, no, 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 we need to get them out there. The problem is at the moment they're just hitting this ceiling and we keep putting hurdles in the way that mean we educate a lot of lawyers but we don't get the benefit of all the lawyers. Mm. Thank you. Could take it a step back to and say are we getting the right kind of people going into law? So and there's a, a clearly culturally determined view of what lawyers are and should be even though the landscape is changing dramatically. 
So we say to a kid who's very argumentative, who mm. thought about doing law, <laughs> uh, you never say to a kid, oh, you're a fantastic listener. Have you ever thought of doing law? I mean, we just <clears throat> don't operate that way as a society, unfortunately. But it will change, I think, if, we, if, if in fact the legal jobs are in that area. Well, and this is where, I mean, we, we haven't really sort of touched on today, I think, the role of, of the public. And there was a question earlier on in, I think, the first session. Um, and I think the answer was, you know, look, the public get, you know, these, these systems. And I think that's right. I think once you've actually got an ODR system, radio buttons and, you know, navigating through screens, absolutely, the public gets it. Um, what I wonder whether we need to do a bit more about is actually trying to t trying to bring the public into these sorts of conversations because, I, and I think I said it earlier, if their last sort of understanding of what you know justice is and what the, ju the publicly funded justice system is about um, is that it's about bricks and mortar courtrooms, then they're not even going to know to go Google searching to find the new things that we're talking about creating. That's right. Mm. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just, just on Katie's point, you know, bringing the public in, I, I sort of thought to myself today, it'll be really interesting um, if the next time we run this, we, we don't run a session like this, we're talking at you. Um, it would be wonderful to run this. This is a, maybe a next idea we can talk about. Um, <laughs> run it as a human-centred design workshop for what the public wants its, its legal sector mm. to be, right? So look at the people in this room. This is incredible that we could get this sort of calibre and breadth of, of professionals and people from different backgrounds and, and interests. Um, and it doesn't happen very often. So I, I guess for me, these sorts of opportunities are quite rare and I would love to see the output of that informing the next wave of policy to projects to funding to bids to business cases like that to me could be a really good kind of way new ways of thinking and again um, it's Beth Novak that keeps talking about you know uh, democracy is in everybody's hands and and that was one of the premise from what we we came out with with the pilot um, it's actually not at all about ODR it's about you know enabling and empowering justice in people's hands that's how access to justice is going to mm. work in the future so um, I would love to see that. I'll sign up to that. Is there signing mm. sheets, Kathy, for the next round? There's, um, most of the questions were premised around lawyers being an obstacle to this. There's a, another question that says, are lawyers adapting and making a living out of providing unbundled legal services and dispute resolution coaching? <coughs> Michael? <laughs> 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 uh, I think lawyers are adapting, and, and it's kind of needs must. Well, certainly in international sport dispute resolution, it's needs must. You know, you uh, so you adapt. Uh, you know, uh, cases where players are all around the world, and, and and there's just no way of doing it otherwise. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think people are adapting. Are they making a living out of it? Uh, we definitely don't make a living out of it. And on an ODR startup, I can tell you that, boy, you'd be mad. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I think that we are seeing legal startups that are making money. Um, I think that it requires a real sort of um, iterative process. So I, if I look at the ones who are who are doing well, they are sort of um, they offer a, a range of products and services. Um, they do a lot of sort of market research about what people need and want. Um, you know, they're constantly monitoring their services to see which ones people are taking up. Um, what's interesting about that is if I think of, you know, some of the more successful ones, um, they've started off with very sort of, you know, innovative, you know, things like, you know, court coaching and, you know, unbundled services. Um, and as things have progressed, they've, they've started to look more like a traditional firm because mm. that's what people are paying for. So that, that's when, when I sort of talk about, you know, we need to kind of create our own markets, that's, that's sort of what I'm talking about. We have really low levels of legal literacy in our community. And so we're talking about what the public want. I mean, and this is going to sound really snobby, and I don't mean to be <coughs> snobby, but I do wonder whether there's also an element of before we can ask people what, you know, they want, We've got to kind of excite their imagination about what they could ask for. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah our, our most successful uh, product at the moment is uh, uh, separation agreements, uh, which people can, and they're automated, and people can do them online and then get independent legal advice and have them certified by those independent lawyers, all for a fixed price, all digital, um, and the funny thing is you get all age groups that do it, particularly, yeah. you know, 60, 70 year old yeah. couples who yeah. go, oh yeah, it's great, yeah, 
can do yeah, and yeah. have done it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's a group of questions that coalesce around the issue. Is there public trust in ODR? How can we make it more attractive? How can we make it better known? And do people think they're getting, you know, Class B legal services rather than the vision they have of uh, being in the high court? Well, very few people have the vision of being in the high yeah. court. <laughs> no, no, they have a vision of it, not the, not remotely the reality of it. Mm. Yeah. Trust is, is the biggest challenge for kind of the, <coughs> the at least the Western world um, and nothing works without it and we are at the lowest point ever yep. of trust in public institutions yep. um, and in politicians and Australia has, you know, we change prime ministers like our underwear, you know. <laughs> and again. And again. Oh, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. I actually think that the more um, people um, have direct access themselves in this kind of new DIY culture, the more they seem to control what they're accessing and what they're doing, mm -hmm. the greater the level of trust in something that, that responds to that. Mm -hmm. The less trust in things that they don't understand. And the reality is people expect to be able to understand everything. I mean, you know, you need a recipe for some weird you know, food thing, you go online and there are online communities that will tell you, oh, your souffle has collapsed or whatever, this is what you do. <laughs> so th there is trust. I've been asked for that. There's, right. So you can get information very easily and reliable information, whereas they're not seeing the same level of responsiveness from their organisation. So there's a mismatch between people's daily lives mm. and what government and courts and others are providing. And that's, I think, the part of the breakdown of the trust. Mm. So I think ODR can help that. Yeah. I, I have a, um, a similar sort of view on, on trust, but I guess more from a, I, again, looking at what the data's told us, because we've researched this quite extensively, um, because it's really hard to build a business case for ODR. If anyone's out there in government land, mm. go and have a chat to Liz and Beatrice and anyone in the team who will tell you it is very hard to build a business case because how do you build a business case for a market that we're not even sure if it exists, yeah. right? So, so if, we, if we look at the indicators around it um, and we look at unmet need, which tells us 630,000 small civil claims and VCAT only servicing a small portion of those based on the structures. So, if you so it sort of sounds good, but then we, we propose a solution which is effectively, you know, end-to-end -end digital services, of which ODR is a component of that. And then we have to get the government, if anyone's in the, the, the um, what was the session, the failures we had to have session with um, the Auditor General and, and the CEO of Cenetex. Um, and then you've got this kind of environment that basically um, tells people that, you know, oh, you know, um, uh, risk is bad and we don't want to fail. So, so there's these endemic structures in all of this, which unfortunately often tends to mean it's a self-perpetuating cycle, which means government's not great at delivering digital services. No. So, so of all the things you don't want to risk, which we all get, is your legal services, because there needs to be a high amount of trust in the public system. So it's not all bad news. There are strategies and techniques to overcome that. And that's hopefully um, some food for thought around how to do it. If, if anyone's heard these terms again, is this agile, agile sort of ways of working, mindsets, chipping away at it. So for me, trust is not something you can talk about. Trust is something you have to show. You have to show people not talk about it. So if you want to build trust in the community, you have to have something to show them to say, are we on the right track, yes or no? And then over time, that will lead to building more trust and you deliver on your promises when you can and you don't overpromise because you, you can't. There's too much uncertainty and you check back with them along the way. So I guess for me, I would love to see trust becoming a conversation about how do we prove it? So I think there's a lot of definitions of, of trust, but I mean, you know, essentially some of the elements of, of trust um, are things around, um, I guess, you see it work, so you know what it's going to do, so you, you know the expectation is clear, um, and then that expectation is met, and that happens a number of times. That's how trust is built. Um, and that can happen on an individual level, and it can happen on a society level. Um, I think a lot of the trust that does exist in our judicial system, and I think that even though we're in a much more cynical time, I think there is still relatively high levels of confidence and trust um, in our 
court system as being you know a place where you are heard where it is fair where whatever outcome um, is reached is you know within the zone of acceptable outcomes um, so I think that you know th there's good trust there and that's not because everybody's been to court most people haven't been to court but it's because over decades we've built up this trust that you know most of the time that the court works well given what we're asking it to do um, whether it's kept whether those expectations are kept up is, is an entirely separate thing so I think that with ODR I think what we need to sort of look at is that we start from a good position there is trust in our public court system and so I think that means our public court system is well placed to introduce ODR mm. um, but I think we also need to be conscious that all it takes is one or two bad experiences and that trust will start to be undermined by one you know by that person um, and, I, and I think there's there's a saying that you know um, you remember sort of the one bad experience but you've got to have every sort of, you've got to have like five good experiences yeah. to outlay like, <clears> the one bad experience and I think we've seen that with a lot of government IT projects we remember the bad ones we don't remember the good ones so I think if we are engaging in ODR we need to be really clear that we set the expectations clearly people know what to expect they know why you're doing it yeah. I think that trust when it comes to government is also about well are you doing this because you want to save on the government's bottom line or are you doing this because it will make my life as a citizen better um, and I think being really clear about who's benefiting is important um, and then it's about meeting that expectation and getting those early wins and building that early confidence that this is a system that works yeah and again if you can co-design it with people then you don't have to play the guessing game. You don't, you know, you don't have to play the, oh, we're not sure if we're gonna erode trust here, are there gonna be these risks? Because you're working them out as you go together. Because there's not gonna be a simple solution to these things. It, it's, it's breaking new ground, and breaking new ground requires new thinking, and it's not a, a, some, a problem that you can solve internally. It's gotta be something that, that has to be sort of solved as a, a collaborative effort. Well, thank you very much for sending us such interesting questions. Mm -hmm. And thank you to the panel for answering them in such an honest and engaging and, and effective way. So let's please show our appreciation. <laughs>